Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Engel. So good to be with you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I, I didn't mention this to you, but I first saw you speak at the Integrative Mental Health Conference, and I thought, oh, he's such a wealth of knowledge. I would love to have him share on the Plant Medicine Podcast. So true honor to have you on. Thank you so much for coming on to share your knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. Now, in that talk, you told us a little bit about your backstory and how you were introduced to psychedelics as a psychiatrist. Actually, is the technical term, are you a neuropsychiatrist? Because I know you have neurology and psychiatry training. Yeah, I've trained in both. I've been board certified in both. Uh, there is actually a, a specific fellowship track where you can get credentialed in neuropsychiatry. Uh, and it's a lot of the information that I've studied, maybe down to even details of biochemistry and neuroanatomy that are more like refresher courses. So I haven't done a fellowship per se in neuropsychiatry. My fellowships were in child psychiatry and forensic psychiatry. And I run a neurology, neurology uh, recovery center right now. Gotcha. So in that journey, as you had told in your story, nowhere are you taught about psychedelics, especially back in the day when you and I went through medical school and training. So can you talk a little bit about your journey into psychedelics? Yeah, it's, I suppose it starts with two weeks before medical school, I broke my neck. That got me into neurology because I was curious about the fact that I became, you know, um, half a millimeter or so from being paralyzed and was good to go essentially after I wore a halo for three months. Um, but I think that just brush of some physically significantly altering experience for the rest of my life got me curious. And wearing the halo also slowed me down quite a bit. And I realized that I, I had more of a humanistic bent uh, constitutionally than I had been expressing. I had just been, you know, just running high school and college and really intense. And it slowed me down. I started reflecting like, oh, I'm actually more interested in the humanistic fields. So that was a perfect blend of psychiatry and neurology. Went through all my medical training, uh, graduated from all my fellowships, started a clinic in integrative psychiatry, helping kids and adults come off of pharmaceuticals. And we were doing great work. And it still, there was something that wasn't kind of like the full picture that I was engaged in at that time. And um, I also, the big impetus actually at the time <clears throat> was the fact that I was going through a divorce and a very different change in my life and I couldn't feel it. I was really emotionally repressed and shut down. Um, where I grew up, it was you know very masculine based archetype, Marlboro man. My dad's like a combination of the Marlboro man and CIA, CIA agent. <laughs> wow. So I kind of learned how to just hold all that really deep. And I realized I didn't want to live the rest of my life like that. So I made a really strong intention, like, wow, I need to do some, and this is after studying psychiatry for 10 years and I realized I was still really shut down and I needed some other tools, some kind of like divine dynamite to open this, this cage up. <laughs> I love that. And, uh, I uh, happened to about a month later be introduced to an ayahuasca circle and I learned more about myself in one weekend of ayahuasca than I had in one decade of psychotherapy. And it made everything that I had learned in psychodynamic psychotherapy seem like kindergarten. And not to make it wrong or like pejorative or judgmental, but to what I mean by that is the opening that happens when medicines are facilitated well is orders of magnitude more powerful than the opening that I had experienced in talk therapy. And so I was super curious and have an adventure spirit and closed down my clinic and was already going through a change in my life anyway. So eventually made my way down to the jungle, lived in the jungle for a year, studied with my teachers there, and then studied, studied only with ayahuasca for eight years. Wow. And that has become my, my longest plant teacher, so to speak. I've studied with other plants and other teachers, but that was the longest and, and really deepest. And to be truthful, when I was living down in the jungle, I didn't plan to come back. I didn't want to come back. I felt like I was home. I was really so deeply connected to that medicine path um, that eventually over about the course of a year, it became clear that if I could do my best work, it was going to be in a, as a liaison or a bridge 
between the traditional plant medicine communities and, and where they're practiced and how they're practiced and the contemporary scientific community to better understand how these medicines can be used in a good way, particularly in the field of psychiatry. And how did you envision being that bridge and, and facilitating those, those conversations? Yeah, that's an interesting question too, because I had had, ayahuasca is classically a visionary medicine. And in some of my earliest experiences, I had visions being on stage speaking about medicine work. And as can happen in many visionary states, it's hard to tease out what is the soul level vision, so to speak, and what's the ego's fantasy. And oftentimes they're very blended. <laughs> so the discernment comes in at being able to just watch and witness that if it's meant to be, that it's going to be something that develops organically and it's in service to everybody. Versus if it's something that I'm driving out of an ego fantasy, it's largely going to be beneficial to me. And so I often, also when I came back from the jungle, I lived in a tent for a year in a suicidal depression because I couldn't relate to society and the way we live and, and how fast we live and how aggressive we treat each other and um, how unsustainable much of our culture is. And there was just, I'd been living at the pace of nature, no running water, no electricity. And I come back and there's just like all this, I felt like I was in a microwave. So it took a while for me to just get planted back in this arena and so all of those early visions, they kind of became irrelevant because I was just coming back to the basics and didn't know how it was really going to develop. So that was classically for me, the dark night of the soul. And then the hero's journey, and, and it's my belief that we're all heroes. So not to make my journey even more important than another's, but when we go through a process of going into the cave or into the dark night of the soul, it has meaning. It is a purposeful process, and we as psychiatrists are told that our role is to rescue people from their dark night of the soul versus help them understand what it could be teaching them. And not to say that I'm I'm up for people having meaning meaningless suffering, but that's part of what we get to do to do in the dark night of the soul is understand how our suffering actually has meaning. And that was the biggest takeaway for me. So I had an inclination that the opportunity would arise for me to start speaking in this regard. And one of my current best friends now, uh, Aubrey Marcus, invited me onto the first podcast that I ever did. And we became friends and connected over discussions around medicine work. And this was 10 years ago. And I remember him asking me way back then, because we met just in a happenstance kind of meeting and got to talking. And he's like, wow, you've got a cool backstory. Let's, let's get this on a podcast. <laughs> and I said, what's a podcast? <laughs> and he says, whoa, dude, you've been out here for a while. <laughs> I guess I have been. Yeah, it's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. By the way, for anybody listening, the documentary that you ended up doing with Aubrey Marcus called Ayahuasca, there's mm -hmm. a soundtrack to it by Porangi, who mm -hmm. has done the the, it's part of that soundtrack is the theme song for this podcast. Nice. Yes, because oh. Porangi and I were in a band. Well, I was in Porangi's band 10 years ago in Arizona, and he very graciously let me use the, the track. <laughs> well, you're going to love this because who's staying with me right now? Porangi and his lady, Ashley. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my oh, gosh. I know. That's incredible. Yeah, that <laughs> He's, they've been here for a few days. There are some of our best friends from Sedona. And I love how small this, these circles are. Wow, this is before you even do a plant medicine podcast. Right. You were in his band. I was That's... in his band. Yeah, 2009, so a decade ago. <laughs> awesome. I love it if Porangi and Ashley just walk in at the end of the interview. This is amazing. <laughs> because all, every episode of this ends with me saying, go to Porangi.com. <laughs> so he can Excellent. Call, you just have him come in and say it himself. <laughs> he is going to love that. Oh, this my gosh. So okay. Amazing. Let me text Sonia and have, have that done. That would be great. That would be fantastic. Okay. I love this. So you start – what, what, so you're in this tent, and you at some point have to 
facilitate your way back to a practice of some sort. And what, how did you, because I know you, you currently work with TBI and you do a lot of integrative psychiatry. How were you able to work ayahuasca into these? Yeah, it, um, first time I, the, one of the reasons that I, I now in retrospect was so drawn to ayahuasca is not only the psychological healing and the soul level healing and the, the emotional healing, it was also the neurologic healing. Because I have had a half a dozen really bad concussions through a variety of different combat sports. And wait, and my last one got turned upside down in a snowboard park, put an eight inch crack in the back of my helmet and started having a really bad PCS, post-concussive syndrome. And this was 20 years ago now. Wow, dating myself. <laughs> and I was actually in my neurologic training. And I was asking my attending physicians about what was happening. I said, you know, I just got really smashed and I'm pretty sure I have PCS and what can I do about it? And they all said the same thing. You're like, okay, what happened? How are you feeling? What are your symptoms? Oh yeah, you've got post-concussive syndrome. Go home and get some rest. We hope it gets better. Like, you know, I've been resting. It's not better. I've been trying to get sleep. It's not better. Uh, you're a neurologist and you have no tools for healing the brain, wow, that must be a frustrating field. <laughs> so I started putting myself in the lab, spent 20 years and a few hundred grand just figuring out what would work and eventually came up with methodologies and protocols and systems and started working with other athletes and put that into a book called the Concussion Repair Manual. And I got my brain scanned at some point during this whole, this is a number of years back, by uh, one of the Amons clinics. Uh, Daniel Amons runs a neurologic suite of services with this SPECT scan machine. You get this really beautiful colored kind of um, cartoon diagram, three-dimensional representation of how your brain's working. It's not an anatomical uh, scan, it's a functional scan. So you would see low blood flow, low glucose uptake. And uh, the, 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 the head of that center in Walnut Creek, he says, you know, I've seen somewhere between 12 and 14,000 brain scans. And I've never seen a brain scan look as bad as yours, function as well as yours. Wow. And I said, I think that's a compliment. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to tell. <laughs> So, yeah, so he says, uh, so what are you doing? Because it's obvious that you've had some damage, and it's obvious that you're working pr at a pretty high level. And I said, you know, I've looked at a lot of different things. Although I hadn't done HBOT, hyperbaric oxygen, and stem cells up to that point. I have done that since, and those also did help even further. But I've done a lot of things, put it in a book. I've kind of geeked out on this stuff. Two things I geek out on are neurocognitive recovery and psychedelic research. And I said, you know, out of everything I've done, I think ayahuasca helped the most. And he said, wow, I've been hearing about this ayahuasca thing. Tell me more about it. So we had this long conversation about ayahuasca. And ayahuasca is neuroreparative. It stimulates BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, uh, as well as GDNF, glial-derived neurotrophic factor. It helps synaptogenesis. We're not sure that it helps neuronal genesis or neurogenesis, but it helps synaptogenesis. So my belief, and no one's told me a better hypothesis or theory otherwise, is that it's stimulated because at this point I've been in 400 ayahuasca ceremonies. And so that's been a lot of synaptogenesis as well as all the other things and supplements and strategies and ketogenics and list is deep. All of those things I think have just built massive synaptogenesis. So these tracks, particularly in the forefront, because I've played soccer for 20 years, and I didn't know until I started researching this, if you're in a boxing ring and you're in a boxing match and you get slugged in the head, it's about 15 to 20 pounds of force to your brain, which is sizable. If you're in a soccer match and you take a full volley like off a punt, you know, from the goalie to the defense, and I'm a defender, right? So I get it back up on the other side of the field. You take a full volley out of 60, 70 yards in the air, that's 70 pounds of force to your brain. Wow. So it's like three to four times as much as getting powerhoused. Wow. 
by a right hook. So, you know, times that 10 times a game over 20 years of games, there's a lot of frontal damage. So if you look at my spec scan, it looks like these two tracks just got eaten out. Like, you know, if a mouse just went to town on cheese. So I think these tracks haven't fully healed in their neurogenesis, but the synaptogenesis, like all the connections around those tracks have really filled in. And every time that I'm in a deep experience of ayahuasca, and most of my teachers live in South America, and I go visit them in Peru, where this has been worked in ceremonial traditional context for thousands of years, I feel my brain comes on line again. So I get fascinated at the opportunity we have for studying and understanding the positive repercussions and benefits in neurodegenerative conditions. And that could be Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy after long-standing concussions. And we've seen some of that early work with psilocybin. And psilocybin and ayahuasca are cousin plants. Ayahuasca is actually a combination of two plants. Psilocybin is one. It's not actually a plant. It's a fungus. And they're both cousins because they're both DMT-based. Psilocybin is 4-phosphoro-oxal-DMT. And ayahuasca is an NDMT from the chacruna plant. And then you have the, the vine, which inhibits its breakdown. So you get a four to six hour effect. Psilocybin, similar six hour effect. And in that time, if you have brain trauma or a neural deficit or hypoactivity, many people feel like their brains come back online. Wow. That's really interesting. Now, if you could take us back, you just explained that ayahuasca is a combination of two plants. For somebody who's not familiar with ayahuasca at all, if you could explain a little bit about those two plants and the chemicals that are contained within. Yes, happy to. Uh, so ayahuasca is the combination of two plants. One is a leaf and one is the bark of a vine. And they're both from the Amazon River Basin in the confluence between Brazil, Colombia, and Peru. And there are untold numbers of plants that we haven't even discovered. It's The estimate is something like 3% of the plant biomass in the Amazon has actually been identified and studied. 3%. Wow. And, and oh, by the way, right now, Every hour that goes by, there's a football field worth of the Amazon River basin that's burned. Yeah. So I can't help but talk about plant medicines in the context of sustainability and reciprocity. I is not a scalable medicine, right? But it is something that we can study and we can better understand for its healing potential. Psilocybin is very scalable. Right? You, know, you can grow a mushroom lab in your closet. I'm not necessarily recommending people do that. It is a bit of a science and you want to know that you're doing it well. But you could. Yes. And as far as disclaimers go, it's also important to know, and we'll, we'll talk about this, what, what are the contraindications, what are the safety aspects to consider? Uh, and you're leading me through that by just speaking about the plants themselves. So the reason I wanted to mention that we only know 3% of the biomass in the Amazon River basin is that the odds of just spontaneously randomly finding the two plants that were going to have this effect and combining them together and cooking them in a very precise way is like a trillion to one it's not a very great statistical variable that is that is likely the inception of how ayahuasca was formulated the story goes, and and it's true, if you work with these visionary plant medicines, your visionary state in your dream time opens up more and more as well, to the fact of having dreams that are quite real and quite directive, like clean up this in my life, this isn't working anymore, this addiction isn't working for me anymore, this relationship isn't working for me anymore, this job that I've been doing for the last 10 years might, might not be my soul's calling Right, so you can get directives. So the story goes is the medicine keepers got the directives 
of how to actually use this specific leaf from the chacruna plant and this specific vine that is called ayahuasca and then blending them th those together, cooking those together in order to have this visionary medicine last over a long period of time. Because the DMT is from the chacruna plant, but if you took it orally, if you just brewed it and drank it, you would have no effect because the enzyme in our stomachs and systems would break down that DMT. But you bring in the ayahuasca vine, which, oh, by the way, is this exact same psychopharmacology as the first antidepressants ever formulated, the MAOIs, the monoamine oxidase inhibitors back in the 50s and 60s. That's how those antidepressants work, and they do work because those enzymes um, that typically the monoamine oxidase enzymes break down the neurotransmitters. Well, if you have an enzyme inhibitor, then you get more neurotransmitters in the system, and that's the same uh, enzyme inhibitor that allows the DMT to stay active for four to six plus hours. So those on MAOIs, that is a contraindication. Yes. yes. Okay. And any 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 psychopharmacology, sorry, psychopharmaceuticals, psychiatric medications are contraindicated, just to be safe. Gotcha. So somebody should... most are relatively safe if you took them. Like other classes of psychiatric medications are relatively safe if you took them, you just wouldn't have much of an effect. Same thing with psilocybin, it blunts the effect. So psilocybin is even safer than, than ayahuasca technically in that arena, but many people who try to use psilocybin while on antidepressants have a blunted effect. So other contraindications for ayahuasca, were heart conditions, blood pressure fluctuations, so there was a New York Times article that just got released last week on elderly exploring ayahuasca, uh, people's in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. And I was interviewed for that article, and the summary statement, I mean, there's a lot to cover, but the summary statement in that article for me is that, yeah, there are contraindications for sure. And when we get older, we are sensitive, our systems are more sensitive. We're more sensitive to environmental stimuli. We're more sensitive to things we put in our body. We're more sensitive to pharmaceuticals. So you and I were taught, start low, go slow for kids and elderly. It's because our, the, the system's more sensitive. So yes, there are contraindications and things to be mindful of for sure. We've just talked about a few of them. There's a lot of pharmaceuticals that don't mix with Aya very well. And then heart conditions, blood pressure issues, Psycho psychological issues, people with schizophrenia or psychosis, mania, or a history of mania, it's not a good idea. And outside of those classic contraindications, the medicine's a very visionary medicine, and it can help people get right at a current stage of their life, especially if they're elderly and they're about, about to approach the death portal or the, the, you know, the death cycle that's going to be looming at some point in the near future. That's why there's so much good data around psilocybin being supportive for people in end of life stage cancer, stage four cancer, psilocybin, a new understanding. And then the new movie that just came out, um, Fantastic Fungi, though psilocybin has been studied in that demographic more, but ayahuasca is just as important, just as impactful to offer people a visionary experience to help get right with their fear of death so that we don't go into the death cycle with all of this fear and hesitancy and, and, and contraction. That's gonna happen for everybody. How can we approach it well? And how can we approach it with reverence and with support and with the process of getting in touch with our fears ahead of time so that we can die with dignity? Yeah, absolutely. Now, before we get into the science, I'd love to talk just a bit on the near-death experience that is where DMT is released endogenously, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was um, Rick Strassman's uh, science and research. And kudos to Rick Strassman because he had the foresight and the courage to study DMT in the late 90s after 20 years of psychedelic research hiatus. And his research really kicked it off again. And it's his belief, as well as other scientists, and I tend to believe this as well because it makes sense, 
and we haven't proven it otherwise, and this is what happens with hypothesis. We have a, a theory, we try and prove it to the best of our ability, but also we try and counterprove it. Uh, so the all the receptors in the body and in the brain have availability for DMT interaction. There are DMT receptors on all cells. And that's evolutionarily for a reason. We wouldn't have developed that just spontaneously for no reason. So DMT has an effect. It has an effect in our bodies. We've evolved with this molecule. What does it do? Well, DMT is called the spirit molecule. And this is thus the movie called the spirit molecule that was based on Rick Strassman's data. 5-MeO DMT is called the God Molecule, um, really similar in that we have this experience of reconnecting to oneness, to the source of consciousness and where life was spawned in the universe. Very classic experiences when people go through these processes. So as DMT is endogenous in the system, otherwise we wouldn't have receptors for it, endogenous means it's within, it's produced within, Otherwise, we wouldn't have receptors. And we can also take it exogenously from the outside, like with ayahuasca or other plants or from the Sonoran Desert toad's venom. And you know, there are other aspects and ways that we can. So we can use it from the outside to stimulate those receptors globally. So the belief is that it's most actively stimulated at the time of birth and at the time of death. So as it would be described in many ceremonies, like in a TP ceremony, DMT is there on the doorway in and on the doorway out. And then in the middle arenas, when we get into really exalted states, and there are, there are states that can do that without medicines, like holotropic breathwork, Stan Groff, legend in the field, right? When LSD went into illegal status in the 70s, he and his wife, Christina, were looking around for other practices that could stimulate altered states and exalted states of consciousness, and they came on holotropic breathwork and then coined this, and that's a powerful breathwork practice that can stimulate a similar DMT-like experience. So we can have access to these states without having to go to medicine work. It just happens to be that medicine work is a... For, when it's done well, when you're working with good medicine and excellent facilitation, it's a pretty reliable experience to, both, to be able to help people open up. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Um, is it released by the pineal gland? Is that where it, they think it comes from? Yes. Okay, okay. Um, now let's get into the research. What conditions has ayahuasca been researched for and what have they found? Great question. It's been researched for a lot of things. Um, I mean, again, if we if we think about the fact that we in the West, we only came into contact with ayahuasca barely 100 years ago. And Richard Allen Schultes was kind of the pioneer, one of the, the fathers of modern botany, and was one of the early explorers down the Amazon River Basin in the early 1900s. There's a really good movie called Embracing the Serpent. Um, that's about his storyline and, and another predecessor to him, a German botanist that went down. And we're studying a variety of different plants. And they were studying also hearing about the spiritual aspects and the transcendent aspects of some of these plants. So we started studying it, but we still are in the, our infancy of understanding, whereas the traditional culture has been working with this medicine for thousands of years. So it's been studied in a variety of contexts outside of our really convenient, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials. And oh, by the way, you'll know if you're on ayahuasca or not. It's hard to have a control arm for that experience. So over the last 60 years, since we've been developing this style of science, what have we learned? Most of the studies are not US-based. Most of them are in Brazil, Central America, South America, Europe. There's a good organization called ICERS, I-C-E-E-R-S, uh, stands for the Inter International Consortium of Antigenic Education and Research Sciences. It's a mouthful, and it's a data, like database full of a lot of really good research. So if we look at the research bodies, um, then the research points to 
a few different uh, columns and strata. What, what is it good for in the body? What is it good for in the heart? And what I mean by that is relationally. What is it good for in the mind? How does it heal mental suffering? And what is it good for in opening up people's consciousness, their, their connection to spirit? Physically, ayahuasca is probably the best psychedelic medicine that we know on the planet. And it might just also be potentially one of the best medicines on the planet for chronic inflammatory bowel conditions. So that would be irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, because those are very much connected to chronic inflammatory issues as well as stress stress being housed in the gut for a lot of people. And also when the gut is inflamed, you don't have as much, as well as if there's an autoimmune issue, we don't have as much uh, optimized neurotransmitter production or transmission to the brain. Most of the serotonin in the body is stored and produced in the gut and then it's transferred to the brain for utilization. When the bowel's off, when the gut's off, everything's off. And because ayahuasca is an oral medicine, you drink it as a tea, it goes in and it's very healing for the digestive system. Um, again, same rules apply, start low and go slow and then do the work. Because we tend to think also, at least from my psychiatry training, that psychosomatic conditions mean that the patient's at fault. Right. Like it's their fault that they have this thing. They're not paying attention, not doing what I'm telling them to do or you know, whatever the thing is that I think I'm supposed to be all awesome and be able to tell them their situation. We as physicians, ideally, especially as psychiatrists, especially in this kind of work, we're oftentimes the supportive agents to help people find their own truth. And so what is it about that inflammatory issue or that chronic experience of discomfort that is there and available for me to learn from. Where did it come from? Oftentimes trauma didn't come from even me. Right? There's a thing called transgenerational trauma. There's a good book called It Didn't Start With You. It's very much about the biochemistry and epigenetics of transgenerational trauma passed on three, four generations down the road. And that might be even more of a reason than the genetics or the predisposition biologically that somebody has family experiences of chronic disease. It might be an epigenetic trauma experience. So I is extraordinarily good for the body for clearing up inflammatory conditions. It's very good for the heart because it's very much de-armoring and available to reconnect in a relational style of more transparency, safety, and security especially if trauma is getting moved through the system and that person's working with a trauma trained therapist. Most of my teachers, they don't fully understand the Western mind other than to know that we're an extractive acquisitional species. And, and we have a really lousy um, track record for sustainability and respect. We tend to go down to the Amazon or other places to extract First it was rubber, then it was oil, and now it's ayahuasca. Well, what happens when there's no more? Like 95% of all the aboga was wiped out in the first seven or eight years of its extraction because of the global demand for addiction recovery support, which is, un which is understandable. There's a lot of addiction. But if we're extracting resources and outpacing their planting, then it's not sustainable and it's not healthy and it's not actually respectful to the communities where these medicines come from. So... It's good for the body, it's good for the heart, it's good for the mind. One of the most excellent indications for ayahuasca is treatment-resistant depression. Because it has a rehabilitated, what looks like, the, the studies show this too, the data seems to suggest that it's rehabilitative for the serotonergic system. Now that might be because it's rehabilitative for the gut. So the you go, you track across the vagus nerve and you, you start working with the brain's microbiome, not just the body's microbiome. And it might be rehabilitative in the serotonergic system. The, the, the numbers are good. We know I is great for treatment resistant depression. We, we're just still trying to figure out how it's doing what it's doing. And but we don't need to know how. I mean, it's helpful because ayahuasca is not scalable. And if we do want to find out another like 
convenient cousin molecule, or if we want to synthesize something as natural of an effect in the lab so that we can scale it out, I get that, and that makes good sense. Um, and then it's very opening and healing for people's experience with connection to spirit and the divinity of all life and the fact that like everything's connected and everybody's life's important and you know that that style of it psilocybin's similar and so when we look at I tend to think of things on the on the level of body mind heart and soul ayahuasca is very much a medicine that works on all four of those levels and the data shows efficacy on all four of those levels Gotcha. Thank you very much. I, if, if anybody else is wondering about the IBD, the inflammatory bowel um, effects from ayahuasca, I just happen to be, in the no coincidences world, the inflammatory bowel chapter of Dr. Joe Tefer's book, um, Fellowship of the River, and he talks about Hi. healing patients, a, a specific patient, but a specific case study of somebody who had really severe, I believe it was Crohn's, Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, but some, uh, one of the IBD conditions, and how not only ayahuasca, but the dieta and other Amazonian adjunct therapies were able to help him significantly so that's something for people to check out if they are that's a great out. book He's, he did a really good job bringing the research together yeah what i really like about it is the the conditions that like psori here using it for psoriasis and using it for um like female problems i forget which one she specifically had but these are things way outside of what we generally talk about which is more of the mind but the, the mind and opening connection um you brought up iboga and its help in treating addiction. Has ayahuasca been proven or shown in any of these studies to have similar effects on addiction? Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that too. I'd put addiction in the mental landscape as far as like diagnostically, but addiction very much affects the body and very much affects relationships and oftentimes is caused by trauma, right? Johan Hari wrote a great book called Chasing the Scream, which is all about the, the fact that the war on drugs never worked and the opposite of addiction is connection, right? It's not sobriety. We all want to be connected. We all were born to bond and it's very much a mental uh, agent of healing that as well. And so it's a spiritual. So addiction covers all four of those. Ayahuasca works on all four of those. When you look at the addiction profiles that it's really good for, it's good for all chemical addictions and behavioral addictions to a much higher degree than your standard of care tends to not be as robust as iboga for something like opioid addiction because iboga works classically on the opioid receptor profile ayahuasca and the dmt molecule doesn't have as much affinity for that receptor profile but if you look at the data dennis mckenna has been involved in a organization called Takiwasi. I'm not sure if he still is. Uh, this was an addiction recovery treatment center that was ayahuasca based. And I believe it is still in activity and um, uh, still seeing clients. And that's been around for maybe, geez, 15 years or so. They've had great data. And the data consistently shows that when people go through a process of preparation experience and integration with addiction recovery, any addiction recovery, especially with medicine too, because you open up so much with so much clarity, the best predictor of success is ongoing addiction recovery coaching. Because the medicines are very good at resetting the addictive neurochemistry, much better than our standard of care by orders of magnitude. And when it resets that addictive neurochemistry is when we have a great opportunity and a leverage point to now bring in the coaching support and positive frameworks and really anchor in the sober living choices to make sure that that opening holds. Otherwise, if people just go back to the normal environment, they're probably gonna start using it again. Yeah, if people are in a using situation or, and not that these are, are parallel, but I just wanted to encompass this both kind of in the same question, if they are on one of the antidepressants that may mute the effects, how do you best recommend that somebody in either of those situations, so who's actively using one of the two things that would be maybe contraindications to using ayahuasca or affect the, the experience, how would you suggest they prepare for going into the, the ceremony work? Ideally, if somebody's on psychopharmaceutical or psychiatric medications, then they need to work with a, a trained psychiatrist that understands how to help people get off of those effectively. And we're trained as psychiatrists to start medications really well, and we're not trained at all on how to help people come off of medications. 
And so that's if I'm working in my private practice, the majority of the time people are finding me for those two very things. I'm on pharmaceuticals. I want to get off. Every time I try and get off, it's oh, it's hell. Can you help me? And oh, by the way, I also want to have an experience. So this is part of my motivation. For me, that's the sweet spot because there is motivation. We know that this is going towards something. So it's kind of like, well, you know, if you're going to have a baby, then it's much easier to deal with cramps and being super uncomfortable as opposed to just like having that experience without knowing that this is like purposeful. Yeah. <laughs> right. So it's the same thing. Like with the, the more meaning we have in our painful experience, the less suffering. And we want when we're meaning making machines. So the more meaning we have, the less suffering goes down. If we know that it might be uncomfortable to orient towards this goal, most people are up for it. And you need a transition. So it takes an integrative psychiatric holistic approach, uh, what I call a freedom from meds kind of approach and looking at all four of those systems. Oftentimes that's lifestyle management, targeted supplementation, especially dependent on the pharmaceuticals that they're working on. Um, and to do it mindfully over time, ratchet it down like the average is like 10% a week. Um, you could do it a little faster or a little slower, but that's about, so that's two and a half months or so. That's a great amount of time to prepare to have an experience for a lot of people, like start doing the uncovery work because psychopharmacology is really good at stuffing symptoms. That's what they're designed to do. They're not, they're not here to cure symptoms. They just help things be a little bit more manageable, which is understandable if somebody's in crisis and they need to take care of their families and have a job and do the thing. Um, but it's also important to know that when you start coming off of those medications, when the core issues start coming up and everything comes up on the way to the ceremony. So it's a great opportunity to get more present and start to uncover it and then be really available to do that work in ceremony. And then if that's been the preparation, usually those experiences are powerful and they're life transformative. I would, in, in the experience of working with a lot of people in this space, friends, family, and clients, greater than 90% success rate in people being able to transition off of pharmaceuticals have, and if the, if the facilitation is excellent and their integration is supportive, greater than 90% efficacy rate. Incredible. And then for somebody who is, say, addicted to alcohol, and prior to ayahuasca, there's a, a diet that you're supposed to try to follow as yeah. best as possible that does not include alcohol. How do, how do they, like say, you know, reconcile those two things? Yeah. Usually there has to be a really good freaking reason, right? Because the addiction has become a really close relationship. And we're, we're problem-solving machines, right? If, if I'm in this crazy amount of suffering mentally, emotionally, physically, and alcohol is one, if not on, my only choice, and I get relief from it, it makes sense that I would continue to use it, right? The addiction is not the problem. It's the pain underneath that's the problem. That's the thing to look at. That's, that's the thing to get curious about. And so... If we can get more curious about it and just change our relationship with it and help people feel less labeled and, and wrong, if they have a good reason, I'm about to lose my job. That's a great reason. Desperation is a great motivation. I'm about to lose my family. I'm about to go back to jail. I'm about to have like whatever. Like, great, let's leverage that. You're going to need to come off of that. This is the mindful way to do it because alcohol detox, as you know, is dangerous. If people just cold turkey alcohol or benzos, they can have seizures, not happy. You can have you can cold turkey, coke, meth, heroin, a lot of stuff, and be pretty safe. It'll feel like hell, but you're pretty safe. Alcohol and benzos, you gotta need to be mindful with that. So to be able to ratchet people down, then to be able to offer them an experience, it really takes a nurturing kind of preparation phase. And also for them to know that alcohol will blunt the effect. Cannabis can blunt the effect of ayahuasca. So when I have had, and I was a daily pot smoker for years before ayahuasca, and it was really clear, like, as soon as I started working with ayahuasca, like, okay, that's done. Because it would just, it was like holding like a wet blanket over my experience. And so there are things to prepare in the diet, you know, food diet, no, no uh, alcohol, no uh, pork, no cheeses, no fermented foods. You know, you want to lessen that 
the potential of a tyramine reaction. It's pretty uncommon that that would happen, or a serotonergic syndrome if somebody's on SSRIs. It's fairly uncommon, but it's a potential. And most often those things would blunt the effect, but occasionally they could make it really freaking uncomfortable or cause some kind of hypertensive crisis, and that's not good. Right, so the, the dietary approach is there for a reason. When people mind that, then they usually have really powerful and healing, maybe not comfortable, but at least safe experiences. Yeah, it sounds like, which is very obvious by this time, is that it's important to have a good team working with you. This is not a thing you try on your own. Okay, I'm going to just go down to the Amazon. I have these current conditions. I'm on these meds. I might have this addiction. Get somebody to work with you both beforehand and then, and like you said, afterward in the integration phase because you want to make the most of the experience you had and the effects that it can have instead of just dropping you back into society without the tools to, to incorporate. Okay, let's round this discussion out with what lasting effects ayahuasca can have. You said yourself you've had over 400 journeys, and I know there's literature regarding the positive effects. Are there any negative effects? And regarding the positive effects that are long-lasting, what are some of those? Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is a great question. Whoa, this could be in a whole other hour. Um, the downside is... If, if, if everything's been safely assessed, no contraindications, and that's off the table, the downside could be the people uncover trauma and they're not ready to deal with it. And they don't have the team to help them deal with it. They don't have the integration support to help them deal with it. That actually happens quite a lot. Because a lot of people are having experiences and they're not having integration support. If people have that integration support and they start to uncover trauma, revolutionary welcome to the next phase of life that is more oriented towards security and safety especially in the way we attach and bond with our world and and each other so the positive effects can can be long-standing after one experience people can be changed for life that's not an uncommon testimonial and that's not a sales pitch for ayahuasca by any means, but it's also quite true. Um, if we're looking at just the kind of day-to-day -day person with treatment-resistant depression that goes through one ayahuasca ceremony, they're going to feel good. I can't predict it, but that's usually how it goes. They're going to feel good, and that's going to last. And then there's going to be this honeymoon phase, and then they kind of come back down to, to ground. But the ground they were on is now leveled up. So it's a different playing field at that point. We're not meant to stay on the peak, but we, and the, and the medicines aren't here to save us. The medicines aren't here to fix us. The medicines are here to show us truth in our path and our work to do. It's still our work to do. And so it actually helps us take ownership of our work. Like let's participate in this process. Give me strength and clarity to be able to do the work that I'm here to do on behalf of myself and all my families and all my generations to come because I don't want them to have to carry the burden that I have or maybe that I've been carrying from my ancestors. It's very much my belief that we have the opportunity to heal the lines of generational trauma through this word. So that can be a one and I don't necessarily like one and done because it's that doesn't really hold the reverence for it. It's just kind of, you know, that's like the biohacking term. You can't hack consciousness. As much as it sounds sexy to do and it sells a lot of books, you can't hack. There's no shortcuts. There are accelerators. There are catalysts. There are things that help move it along faster and stimulate it to happen quicker than it might not already ha than it might uh, happen otherwise. But it's still my work to do. Maybe it helps me drop the load, so I'm not carrying like my all this trauma up the mountain. But it's I got still got to walk the mountain. So it's a very individual process, but when I've seen it done well, it can, one ceremony, and it's usually one weekend, like it's either two or three ceremonies, so technically, but like one weekend workshop can be life transforming, 100%. Was for me, has been for my little sister, has been for my little brother. Um, as you know, I mentioned in that, in that talk at IMMH that we lost our older sister to addiction and depression, and I wish I knew then what I know now, and I would have taken her down to have an experience because the we have privilege to work with these tools that many of our ancestors didn't have the privilege to work with. And many people um, are using these medicines with reverence and respect, and many people are not. So I'm, I'm just so thankful that you're putting this 
message out there that you're that you're helping educate the next wave of physicians and allopathic providers and clinicians globally to help understand how and when to use these medicines well because these are some of the most powerful tools for consciousness and it is any tool it can be used to in, in a constructive way and can also be used in a destructive way yeah absolutely i love how you brought up on the episode of wellness force with josh trent and talked about speaking of allopathic how in your training you, you're taught mostly like the psychopharmaceutical stance which is not curing anything and is definitely not digging into that zero to five age range where you said like you alluded to a lot of the trauma happens that forms our personality but sci mm -hmm. but ayahuasca can't mm -hmm. work into that yeah. area right yeah yeah 100 percent. so so talk therapy helps to establish a trusting bond which is so helpful and you can't replace that and talk therapy is limited in that it can only get so far back into the memory and the narrative. Well, most of the trauma lies pre-verbal. So it's not going to be easily accessed in talk therapy. When you combine the two, when you've got a trusting relationship to be able to help you work with and do therapy and counseling and coaching and mentorship in the integration phase of that new recognized truth, that's, that's a really accelerated path. So some people would say, well, it's all about plant medicine or no, it's all about psychotherapy. I say, actually, you can, buy, you can combine them both together quite well. Yeah, yeah I, I love that. Would you please share with people what projects you're working on and where they can find you? Certainly. Um, <laughs> well, my team and I just got together and, a couple of weeks ago, and I'm working on about a dozen different projects. So I'll just give you the short version. <laughs> um, I'm putting together a more formalized freedom, freedom from Meds program. This is a program that I worked with over the last 10 years, helping people get off of pharmaceuticals. Um, Bold, uh, Brain Optimization and Lifestyle Design. This is the coaching program for the book, The Concussion Repair Manual. Um, the, uh, I run a neurologic recovery center called Revive outside of Denver here. That's revivetreatmentcenters.com. Or no, it's revivecenters.com. Uh, we're about to launch our Transformational Medicine Center in Austin in April called Kuya, K-U-Y-A, which means uh, love in Quechua. And uh, Psychedelic Success is another program that I'm launching with Deanne Adamson, who runs Being True to You. Uh, we're partnering up with the Third Wave um, to support them and their organization. Um, and that's probably enough for now. <laughs> We can always put more in the show notes later when the episode comes out Yeah. in, in, a, in a bit of time. Um, before we wrap up, is there any chance Podongi is around and we, he could step in? That would be so fun. Yes. Yeah, I, uh, I didn't get a chance to. Let me, let me just give him. My dear editor me, would be kind and he will just cut this part out so we, no hurry. Okay, let me, let me find him. Sure. Is uh, Karangi still here? Uh, not sure. Man, this is so funny. Uh, the woman I've been podcasting? Yeah. That would be so funny. That's fun. <laughs> Super good. I'm just finishing up a podcast. Can I call you back in five? Okay, great. Talk to you in a bit. Bye bye.
Okay, so luckily, he is still here. Uh, he's wrapping up, and he's going to come up in just a moment. Sweet. Very cool. Well, then we can just chat for a second if you've got a second. Yeah, I do. Cool. Do you know, I'm assuming that you know Dr. Samuel Lee, because when I looked at your list of places that you were working in Sedona, they seemed to sound like the places he was working in Sedona. I think he just started working at ATMC, yeah? Uh, what does that abbreviate? Uh, alternative, alternative meds. Yes, 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 yes. Ah. He's the one who got me to go to your talk at the Integrative Mental Health. Because I, I did not go to that conference. He just said, um, nobody is monitoring the door. Go to this place at 8 in the morning or whatever. <laughs> and so I walked in. Nice. Yes. Awesome. Yes. How do you know? Well, um, I, he had written something for, I think, either Psychedelic Times or Psychedelics Today. And it was just kind of like, a, hey, I'm a doctor, and I did Ibogaine. And... I was just very curious at this point. I, I started plantmedicine.org as a place to put this podcast and just to put a ton of resources to everything. And so I thought, here's another person like me, just a doctor who's doing psychedelics. And so I figured I'd reach out to almost anybody I could, and he's in L.A. And then I, at the same time, I met Martin Polanco mm. around the same time. Uh, and turns out they were working together. And so then suddenly I just had this circle of people that all knew each other um, because I had – I was in an ayahuasca slash mescaline wachuma, like grandmother, grandfather ceremony with uh, somebody named Bob, who is a brain trauma person. He runs the San Diego Brain Center, um, former Navy SEAL. And another former Navy SEAL who turns out was my patient nine years prior at the VA. Huh. And um, one of the few I had remembered. And so I, I like and he had been down working with Martine. So just suddenly I was surrounded by these people and Samuel was one of them it was just like a network of non you know coincidences that right worked out like that yeah <laughs> just keeps working out like that it does so when Which... samuel said go see your talk i was like i don't question anything anymore <laughs> <laughs> just show up Good. i just show up though what was even funnier he and i samuel and i had gone to karaoke the night before stayed out way too late i went to your talk on two hours sleep and somebody like the week prior had given me some Kratom. Again, like everybody's giving me these things to try. You're going to cover this on your podcast. But Kratom doesn't come with instructions. And I thought, well, I hear it can, you know, help increase focus. And I am very tired. So I take like a scoopful and put it in my protein smoothie. Uh -oh. <laughs> I made it through your talk. And then I walked out and I was like, I think I'm going to die. Like, what's happening? <laughs> nice. Yeah. A scoop of Kratom will typically get your attention. <laughs> Yes, and I still did. I was just like, oh, this is sleep deprivation, or I must have had something bad the day before. It took the second time that I did the exact same thing to be like, nope, this is not. <laughs> to, for me to call my friends and be like, what's the dose on this? Uh, much smaller. Porangi! <laughs> How are you? Great, did great. He, did he tell you who you were going to see on this Skype call? He said, someone who you played in, in the band with 10 years ago. And I'm like, oh, yeah. It narrows, <laughs> it narrows it down, but. <laughs> I, had a, I had a hint. I was like, oh, I think I know who that is. <laughs> yeah. The odds. Uh, pretty good, actually. Pretty but, good. Pretty good odds. Yeah. Pretty good. I was telling uh, Dr. Dan in the middle of this podcast, I was like, well, you might be in interested to know that, in case you haven't heard this podcast before, the intro music is by the same person who did the music for Ayahuasca that you were in, Poragi. He's like, he's staying at my house. And I said... Yeah, it's perfect timing. It's perfect timing. I said, well, it's funny because the end of every episode of the Plant Medicine Podcast is me talking about Porangi and saying, go to Porangi.com. And I said... Oh, oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> so I was like, it would be lovely if Porangi just walked in the end of the podcast. So um, yeah. thank you for your beautiful music and letting us start yeah, each so episode with it absolutely it's a it's a joy i'm glad to support it. and yeah i'm really glad this is happening this is a good conversation it, i'm gonna have to tune into this after yeah it's been good it was incredible like i had no expectation and yet any expectation i could have had has been exceeded about yes. a minute fold so <laughs> yes yes yeah dan is is one of the most incredible human beings i know so yeah yeah yes really I feel awesome I feel very, very blessed, and especially to have you both now. I'm seeing you both on the screen at the same time and on the podcast waves, and um, yeah. I adore you both. And so thank you both for being on the podcast in your different ways. You're so welcome. Yeah, yeah. super good. Thanks yeah. for the conversation, Amory. Yeah. Absolutely. I appreciate it so much. Um, for everybody else out there, until next time. <laughs>